Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us. My name is Katie Earl, and I'm the coordinator of the University Express program, and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. And we are joined with Chuck Bannis, who also works for Erie County. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Katie. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure to be here. Well, and not to embarrass Chuck, everybody, but he is one of the reasons our classes are able to run so smoothly. So I appreciate Chuck for everything he does for us and he's behind the scenes. So now he's right in front of you. So this is the man behind the action. So I'm not, I'm not used to being in the spotlight. <laughs> so, uh, but this will be fun. This is a, an interesting topic and, uh, at least it is to me and, uh, hopefully it will be to everybody else. And, uh, um, I don't know how many, I don't know how many people do we have signed up uh, today? We have 58 people registered. Wow, that's a lot. Okay, that's, that's a good amount. That's pretty awesome. We've got about 20 people on right now, including a couple centers. So we are, we're broadcasting, Chuck. You can't hide now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, is a, a now a good time to start, you think? Yeah, you can go ahead right. and share your presentation, but first I'm going to tell people how to communicate with us and read your bio. So if you're new to us here today, you have joined muted and without your video showing, and it's not because you've done anything wrong. Those are just the settings for our program today. And as Chuck goes through his presentation, feel free to type any questions and comments you have in the Q&A panel. So if you're on a computer, you'll find that likely at the lower right hand part of your screen. You just click on that, expand it, send your questions right to me. You may have to click enter or return on your keyboard, depending on your setup there. And if you're on a tablet or smartphone, touch your screen. That brings up your control panel. You will likely have to press on that button that has three dots. Then you'll see your Q&A. So we hope you're able to participate and ask all your questions. I know that I have a lot of them, but let me introduce the star of the show here. So Chuck works for Erie County's IT department, supporting the county staff with technology, and he helps coordinate the county social media. He's also a part-time urban planner, hockey player, lover of all things Buffalo, and perennially disappointed Sabres fan. We won't go there, Chuck, but thank you for being here. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen now and we'll get started with the presentation. Um, let's see. As long as I click on the right buttons here and then uh, that should do it. Perfect. Are we all set? Good. Yep. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for the kind intro, Katie. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is uh, Chuck Bannis. I work for the county's IT department, which technically is called the Division of Information Support Services. Uh, that's a heck of a mouthful, but uh, basically what it means is, uh, uh, at least my job is, I wear a lot of different hats uh, in regard to technology. And I uh, um, also support uh, and help coordinate the county's social media and I do internal support for things like the website and uh, WebEx, which is what we're using now. And um, uh, it's the best nine to five job I've ever had. So I, I enjoy my time here. And uh, um, in my spare time, I take an interest in a lot of different things, uh, but uh, a lot of technology issues interest me. and. Uh, we're surrounded by it today, by the, the world of the internet, wired and wireless. Um, everyone's connected all the time. And uh, I think it's uh, interesting and useful to learn a little bit about this stuff, find out how does it work? Where did it come from? Um, today, we're gonna be talking about 5G, which is the fifth generation uh, wireless technology that's just been coming online over the past year or so. and. Uh, We'll get started here. We want to know what the big deal is with it. Um, many people watching this now have a 5G enabled phone. It's one of the newer any one of the newer phones that's come out in in the past year or so. Uh, you can tell if you're on a 5G network by the little icon usually at the top of, the, of your smartphone it says 4G LTE or 5G. It tells you what type of network you're on. Again, the G stands for generation. There, this is now the fifth generation of uh, wireless technology that's been deployed. And it's going to enable a lot of really uh, 
amazing stuff, stuff we haven't even thought of yet. Um, basically, it's going to be faster, have a lot more capacity than 4G. Every iteration, every su subsequent generation of technology has always been faster with higher capacity, higher speeds, um, and been able to do a heck of a lot more. Uh, 5G has also been the subject of a little bit of controversy. Uh, mostly, it's the crazy conspiracy type. We're not going to delve too much into that into this, uh, but suffice it to say, we're going to learn a little bit how 5G works, and uh, this should clear up any controversy in anyone's minds here. So uh, the magic skills that 5G has really amount to three things, high bandwidth, low latency, and dense connections. And what does high bandwidth mean? Basically, it means that you're going to get much faster speeds. Uh, for a typical uh, movie on 3G, if you were on 3G trying to download an hour and a half long uh, HD movie, it would take about 26 hours. 4G took about today with most phones uh, are on 4G. It takes about six minutes. And with 5G, theoretically, at its maximum speed, it'll take only about 3.6 seconds. So you can see there's a huge difference in speed and capacity uh, with these uh, last three generations. It also has extremely low latency. Uh, this is a kind of a fancy word. Basically, latency is response time. How fast does it take a system to respond to an input, to a request? So if you're typing in a web page, a web address in your web browser on your smartphone and you hit send, how long does it take the network to actually respond to that request? And that is going up uh, even much higher than uh, the download speeds that you're going to see. Under 4G, uh, on average, we're seeing about 0 0.045 of a second in uh, latency with response time. And then under 5G, eventually we're going to get to uh, 0 0.001, uh, one one thousandth of a second um, uh, of response time. So that's basically a, a 40, and in some cases, even a hundredfold, about a hundredfold increase in. in uh, late in latency uh, performance. So it's going to be a very, very quick uh, system. And in many cases, uh, it'll be effectively instantaneous as far as human beings are concerned. So we're going to see huge increases uh, in the responsiveness of the new system. Now, the third one, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation, are dense connections. Instead of uh, having fewer uh, larger towers, we're going to have many, many smaller uh, towers or uh, uh, communications nodes for the cellular network spread uh, throughout communities. There are several reasons for that, but that, that's going to also help make the system much more uh, responsive and, and it'll be able to have much more capacity, handle much more data and many, many more devices. It's going to make things like autonomous vehicles uh, a lot better, a lot safer because of that quick response time that it's going to have. Uh, these uh, cars basically, all these vehicles need to kind of see the road, um, see what's around, see what's in the environment, even talk to other autonomous vehicles that happen to be nearby. And all of that requires a very, very quick response time. There's lots of decisions being made thousands and thousands of times a second by these vehicles, and they need to be, be able to communicate at a very high rate to be able to do that. Uh, remote, some remote manufacturing uh, will be able to take place now that we've got, uh, we can con control machines and manufacturing processes and stuff remotely. That's going to that's gonna open up a whole new field. You don't need to, to be present in the facility to actually operate some of these machi machines. So even things like remote work, um, remote manufacturing work will be uh, possible. And even uh, things like remote surgery, uh, which is, been done before, but this is going to start to make things like this a lot more common and open it up into the mainstream and instead of uh, uh, the experimental realm where it is now. But the rollout is not going to be very, very fast. You can see uh, this projection through 2025. Uh, 4G is still going to be about half the market. 3G about a little less than a third of the market, 
and 5G will only be about 14% of customers. It's even there's still a, a, a trace amount of 2G, about 4% projected as of 2025 as well. Uh, now this is for the United States. Uh, other countries like China are taking a little more coherent state-driven approach to building out their 5G network. Uh, in the US and much of the West, it relies primarily on competition between carriers. We'll get into this a little bit later too. So we're not gonna see all the benefits and all the speeds and all the capacity right away. But first, before we talk about the future, we're gonna talk a little bit about the past because it's always useful to see uh, how this stuff came to be, how we got to where we are and where it all came from. The first generation network started in 1979 in Japan. Uh, that was analog only. There was no data. It wasn't even digital. Uh, it was just for, just for voice calls. And in the early 80s, that's what we got. Um, and starting at about 1991, we got the first digital system, which was uh, the second generation. And uh, at that point, we started to be able to do standard texts. Um, everyone remembers those uh, T9 texting phones, those little candy bar phones, especially the Nokia ones, which became rather rather famous. That's when we started texting. And of course, we all remember, at least those of us old enough to remember, uh, the text limits that we had. And you'd get charged for going over all the time. So people had to text in shorthand, and we developed this whole new text text speak language to be able to do that. Dude, and that was due primarily to uh, the bandwidth uh, limitations of, of those early systems. They wanted to keep uh, uh, usage down to a, a manageable level. Uh, so they charged people for it. So if you went over, I don't know, if you sent more than like 20 texts a month or something like that, you'd be charged depending on the plan that you had. Uh, starting in about 2001, we had the 3G system, which was a significant increase in speed over 2G, and that was when we really started to get the internet, or at least the baby internet, on a lot of our devices. And that was the era of uh, things like the BlackBerry and some of the early smartphones. And we could even do things like, like regular decent email on our devices. Uh, starting in about 2009, the 4G systems started coming online, and that was only a couple years after the first iPhone was introduced, and that. Uh, the 4G system plus uh, the faster 3G and uh, and new smartphones like the iPhone really created a revolution in how we use our devices and the amount that we that we use them. This is a, about 10, 12 years ago is when we everyone started to be connected all the time online. And then we had things like tablets that came out as well, like the iPad and other tablets, touchscreen PCs that were uh, connected to cellular networks. All of that stuff started to proliferate over the last 10, 12 years. That's pretty much the world we live in today. Uh, so what's gonna happen with 5G? Don't really know. Uh, we're talking about the future here. Nobody could have predicted uh, the phenomenon that say like the iPod was, and then the iPhone, uh, and then the iPad, and all of these uh, uh, different products that had come out and different uh, ways that people use the internet and use the cellular network as well. Uh, so the, the the future remains unwritten. It's a, it, it's an exciting time. It's also uh, to some people for some people a very worrying time. Um, I know personally, I, I'm not particularly fond of the idea of autonomous vehicles, uh, driverless vehicles, uh, just going around everywhere without a human being in them. Maybe they'll be safer. Maybe they won't. I know there's been some horrific accidents uh, in testing with a lot of these uh, uh, driverless cars. And uh, I think the technology is still largely unproven. But 5G will usher in uh, a lot of this stuff, maybe even a little quicker than we might think. So just to, just to recap here, the first G was fully analog, just voice only. Uh, 2G was uh, the first digital network. We could text. Uh, 3G, we basically got the internet. And then we got high speed internet with 4G. And then 5G is going to uh, 
really usher in the internet of things, that whole uh, era that a lot of technologists point to where everything is hyper-connected. Even your refrigerator is talking to the internet uh, and you're, we, we've got thermos, smart thermostats and other lots of smart devices. Now, this is going to make this is going to ensure that we have the capacity to handle all of those devices. The speeds too. I'm going to uh, we'll do a quick speed comparison. The numbers aren't all that important, but the relative uh, speeds are the first generation uh, was voice only. So speed didn't matter. It's kind of doesn't didn't make any sense to even talk about it. But the first digital network, which could could do data was 14.4 uh, to 200 kilobits. They improved it quite a bit over time. Uh, the 3G network was uh, 3.1 to 42 megabits per second. That's a thousand times a kilobit. Um, so you can see the speeds were increasing geometrically. In 4, 4G on a good day, maybe you'll get 100 megabits. Theoretically, you'll get maybe 200. Most people will get around 40 or 50 on their phones. And then, the 5G network theoretically will be a gigabit or a thousand megabits per second. So we're probably going to be around 10 times faster when the system is fully uh, built out, 10 times faster than 4G. So in the 80s, of course, you remember everyone remembers Gordon Gecko and talking on his Motorola Dynatac phone. Again, voice only. 2G, we've got. Uh, uh, a lot of different phones came out then, but the Nokia's probably were the most famous. Certainly the size uh, decreased considerably. In the uh, 2000s, we had uh, the first really usable smartphones like the BlackBerry and the Motorola Q, and then the first iPhone. 4G, we've got this proliferation of new devices all over the place, including tablets and lots of smart devices. Now, this is a bit of trivia too. Uh, in the 2G and 3G era, uh, many of you may remember that there was this uh, competition essentially between CDMA networks and GSM networks. CDMA and GSM are just technologies that are that uh, devices use to talk to the towers. And uh, um, Verizon and Sprint were CDMA, and, which was more or less uh, a domestic technology for the United States. And GSM, uh, stands, that stands for Global System for Mobiles, that was the rest of the world. So uh, networks like uh, uh, AT&T uh, were GSM, and uh, there was this competition. And you, the, if you got a CDMA phone, it didn't necessarily work with a GSM carrier and vice versa. There was an incompatibility between them, unless occasionally you got a phone that worked with both. Um, CDMA stands for Code Division Multiple Access. Uh, that's a mouthful. But what do these technologies mean? These are basically uh, the similar technologies for being able to uh, avoid interference uh, by hopping uh, around on a, uh, doing frequency hopping, essentially. This is all happening in the background. So if the phone senses there's too much interference, or the tower senses there's too much interference on a certain channel, it quickly switches the channel. And if there's too much interference there, it switches another channel. So it's constantly searching and hunting around uh, all these different frequencies, hopping around to find the best signal, and even sending data and, uh, and, and voice data uh, through multiple frequencies, basically all at once. So originally, this was developed by, for the military to uh, uh, avoid jamming in a say a, a combat situation uh, and to in increase reliability um, and in fact uh, much of that technology for CDMA was developed in Buffalo in Sylvania um, in the in the 1950s and it was employed first I think by the Navy during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, incidentally I know we we had a, a presentation by Richard Durwald a couple of them recently uh, hit, uh, the uh, fit, the fitness guy at the at Erie County senior fitness guy. He uh, his father worked for Colonial Radio Radio, which was bought by Sylvania, and they moved their uh, uh, operations around town. But uh, they kept a lot of research and development, and they did stuff for the military. So CDMA actually came out of uh, the military. It was declassified in the 80s, and Sprint uh, adopted it for use in their phones. So there's a local connection here to uh, cellular phone technology. A lot of these techniques that CDMA and GSM use 
to increase reliability and bandwidth uh, are, are still used today in 4G and, and even 5G networks. So that's our local connection. So what is 5G? Basically, it's just an evolution or, or a, a refinement of 4G and 3G and all the older technologies. Uh, everyone's familiar with, you look at the top, tops of buildings and cities and towns and you see all of these uh, cellular uh, uh, antennas up there. Uh, out in the countryside, of course, you see the big cellular towers. Uh, but essentially, uh, they're all using the same technology, whether it's from 1G all the way up to 5G. And here, without getting uh, too deep into it, uh, this is a, just a, a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you look down uh, t toward the right here, where the lower energy waves are, the, the, the lower frequencies, We've got things like radio and TV and microwaves, and where it says 5G there on the lower right, that's where basically all the 1, 1G through 5G cellular networks operate. Um, if you look down toward the center there, that's where vi visible light is, where we get up, up slightly higher frequencies and higher energies. And then once we get to the left-hand side, we get things like gamma rays and X-rays, all the really high energy uh, frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. And that is generally referred to as ionizing radiation. Those, those are the frequencies you need to stay away from. Those do, uh, they, ionizing basically, they, they're uh, able to knock electrons off of uh, atoms and uh, can destroy molecular bonds and destroy uh, soft tissue and even uh, uh, screw up your DNA. That's the ionizing rate radiation that's dangerous. And if you notice, uh, the cellular frequencies are way down at the other end, the low energy part, the, basically the radio frequency part of the spectrum. So if you're worried about 5G or, uh, or 4G or any other bit of cellular technology, then you might as well be worried about uh, the light bulbs and lamps in your house, uh, because those are far more energetic uh, than uh, radio waves and microwaves and, and all of the cell cellular uh, frequencies. So that's just a basic lesson on electromagnetic spe spectrum. Um, the 5G technology relies on roughly five techniques and technologies to, to get higher bandwidth, higher capacity, and, and really high responsiveness. Uh, millimeter waves, uh, which are higher frequency than the, the previous generations. Uh, small cells, we talked about that a little bit earlier, many smaller uh, uh, transmission and uh, receiving towers instead of uh, fewer large ones. Uh, massive MIMO, I'll talk about what that is. Uh, that's actually a pretty simple concept. Uh, many home uh, wireless routers actually employ the same technique. You'll see those MIMO router, routers for cell. Uh, beam forming, talk about that, and full duplex. So quickly, we'll go through every one of these. Uh, the first thing is millimeter waves. Uh, it uses a higher frequency than 4G uh, in many instances. The, the highest speeds of 5G will use the highest frequencies. And the reason, uh, uh, they chose to do this is because the higher the frequency, the more data you can squeeze, the higher the bandwidth, essentially, uh, that you, you can squeeze on a particular frequency. So the, the faster your download speeds will, will be. One of the downsides, though, of higher frequencies is that they don't penetrate things as much. They're more susceptible to interference, they, and, they don't, and they don't travel as far. So even things like uh, you know, the walls of a building will... Uh, stop these uh, waves from propagating. Even things like trees and rain can uh, affect these uh, frequencies dramatically. Um, for that reason, uh, instead of fewer towers spread further apart, we're going to need a, the new network's going to need many, many more small cells uh, of transmission towers. Uh, so it, Typically, what you have is one large tower that covers a fairly large area, several square miles or more. 
depending on whether you're in the city or out in the countryside. Uh, the problem with 5G, of course, is there's lots of obstacles in the way, uh, buildings, trees, whatever. So the idea with 5G is you have a lot of many smaller towers spread throughout the system so that they can kind of act as a big relay team uh, and avoid all of those uh, potential obstacles and uh, points of interference. Pretty simple concept. We're just going to have a lot more of those uh, tra transmitters and receivers around. Uh, the second is, uh, or the third is massive MIMO. Uh, this basically stands for uh, multiple input, multiple output. It's a, it's a technology uh, that essentially increases the efficiency and the amount of uh, uh, bandwidth that can be used at any one moment. Um, and in terms of uh, cellular towers, it basically means we're going to have uh, a lot more antennas and a lot more transmitters on it, on every tower. So this will increase the capacity and efficiency of the system greatly. Um, but of course, if you have all of that stuff working together, uh, lots of those uh, towers close to each other, there's always that potential for lots of interference between all of these uh, different devices. So the uh, next technology that's gonna be used is called beamforming. Basically, uh, it's gonna, when you're walking around with your cell phone and you're near a tower that you're communicating with, the tower is gonna recognize where your phone is and direct, instead of broadcasting everywhere in every direction, it's gonna actually form the beam and direct uh, its data stream right at your phone instead of broadcasting out in 360 degrees everywhere. Um, and that will increase the, the efficiency of your connection to the tower and of course, uh, increase the, uh, decrease the amount of interference uh, that can happen with all these devices connected at once. And the last uh, technology that's being used is is full duplex. Uh, this gets a little technically won wonky. I am not a uh, electrical or electronics engineer, um, but this stuff is still kind of fascinating. You can kind of think of when you're broadcasting on a single frequency, um, you can only go one direction at a time. You can think of what, uh, the data that's being carried on a certain uh, wavelength, uh, a certain carrier frequency as a train. Uh, that's going in a certain direction. Um, the problem is uh, there's actually uh, a bit of uh, flowback of that data. Data tends to go want to go both directions along the carrier wave. And uh, you really can't send uh, data in both directions at the same time due to these types of effects. So it's almost like having an, a train come in the other direction. And you know what happens then, it just won't work. Uh, what uh, what this technology does is it actually allows both data streams uh, to temporarily bypass one another, so you can more efficiently use each uh, frequency, each carry frequency that that you're on. So all of these technologies together, and probably a, a bunch that we haven't even thought of yet, will uh, will build out eventually uh, the full 5G network. Um, it's still a work in progress, keep that in mind, and we're, we're not probably not gonna be fully built out on it for another five years or so. Again, uh, I showed you this graph before, but uh, you can see that uh, by 2025, 5G is only still gonna be about 14% of the, uh, of the market. 4G will still have the majority. Now, part of the reason uh, this build out is so slow is due to cost. Uh, this is an estimate uh, that, we, that uh, we did kind of a back of the napkin. If you wanted to give 100 megabit speed to 72% of the US population, or one gigabit speed to 55% of the population, that re would require 13 million new uh, base stations to be constructed. That's a lot, at about $30,000 a piece. 
that is $400 billion that the carriers are going to have to spend to build out uh, this 5G network. That's one of the reasons it's uh, take, taking so long. Um, in fact, the, the technical hurdles, basically the financial hurdles for the carriers uh, were so big that they asked the FCC to relax the 5G specifications so they can start calling other things 5G. Um, so what, they, what they've done is actually uh, split their 5G services up into three frequency bands, uh, low band, mid band, and high band. The low band uh, services offer much better coverage because they're lower frequency, um, but you don't get speeds that are really that much different than current LTE, but they're calling it 5G anyway. Uh, because they got the FCC to relax those specifications. Uh, the the mid-band um, offers, it's probably the sweet spot of the services, and right now only T-Mobile is offering it. And you get uh, about 500 megabits per second, which is probably you know three to four times what you get on LTE, on 4G LTE today. Um, and you get decent coverage as well. And then the uh, the high band, the high frequency, which is really high bandwidth, uh, you get really poor coverage, but you get really high speeds in the places that you can get it. So we're going to see the major cities built out uh, with all of these networks because they're going to require a much higher density of, of uh, towers and transmitters. So you can see how this whole thing is evolving. And, and what originally was spec as 5G isn't. Uh, so you'll be getting 5G, but it, depends on where you are and 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 when that is or sometime over the next five years and depending on the on the carrier that you're using as well uh, so that's the, the end of my presentation for today uh, uh, thank you for uh, listening and uh, how are we doing on time Katie oh we're fine and we have several questions too so great thank you oh Chuck that was awesome you explained it in such a way that was like simple and chunked up. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. I I tried to I tried to dumb it down because I'm I'm not even that smart. So <laughs> <laughs> you answered a couple of questions along the way. So the first one that I'm seeing is, what is being done to close the disparity between urban and rural areas? Uh, that's a good question. It depends on the region. Um, I know in. Uh, Erie County, where we've been working on ErieNet, the county exec has made that a, a, a priority to uh, bring high speed Internet service to uh, as many people throughout the county as possible, particularly the rural areas uh, that are underserved. Um, there's also areas of the city which are under uh, underserved on Verizon with their Fios, the fiber optic system. Um, they the. The common count, the city common council said many years ago that uh, if you're, they were going to lay fiber, it would have to be citywide. They didn't want to. They didn't want Verizon going into only the the richer neighborhoods and ignoring the poorer neighborhoods, and so that stalled uh, the fiber optic, at least Verizon's fiber optic uh, service in the city for a long time. Now I know I think there are some areas of the city that actually do have FiOS now, but uh, um, so so the 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 issue happens uh, in both urban and rural conditions. Uh, the gr great thing about 5G is that if and when it's built out, it'll offer speeds that are comparable to wired service. So in in many cases, we'll be able to uh, you'll be able to get uh, really really high speed, super high speed internet service at home without ha having any fiber or cable coming into your house. It'll just be coming through the air. The, the, the problem, of course, is in uh, low population areas, and particularly, there's not much of an incentive for uh, the carriers to uh, build out their system in, in those areas. So that's, that's, uh, that's a, a tough situation. I know that different governments and the federal government will probably be offering incentives uh, to carriers to do so, um, but I don't know any more of the details. That remains to be seen. 
Okay, thanks, Chuck. Uh, we had a question come in that you kind of touched on. So this person's wondering, is wireless internet in my house considered 5G? Ah, um, well, it depends on your equipment, but it's not considered, it's not technically 5G. Uh, wireless internet in your house is not a cellular technology. It's not a mobile technology. It's similar in many ways, but it's a whole different set of uh, hardware and firmware and software that that runs it. Um, it's also extremely low um, short range, um, but you can get what are essentially uh, 5G speeds on on a really good home wireless network right now. So when when you see a five gigahertz home network, don't confuse that with 5G, which is a, a, a fifth generation mobile technology. Uh, although uh, 5G is now approaching and even surpassing the, the speeds of uh, most home Wi-Fi networks. Okay, thanks Chuck. Uh, I apologize for any background noise you're getting from me. You've got some vacuuming in the back oh, there. <laughs> I don't um, hear it at all. Okay, good. This next question is, can you explain why or how networks get bogged down if a lot of people are on their phones at one place? Uh, yes, you, you, you will, you'll see this often in uh, like large festivals or huge gatherings of people where maybe you've got, um, you know, 100,000 people attending an event, say the Allentown Art Festival or something like that. Um, the system isn't really built uh, to, for the most part, to take those uh, spikes in use. So if you've got, you know, uh, say out of 100,000 people, say maybe 50,000 people within several square miles are using uh, three or four of the towers that happen to be accessible within range. And the system just isn't built for that. Um, most systems aren't built for that. They're built to, to take a little excess capacity depending on what happens daily. But uh, oftentimes with these larger events, uh, you you'll see these uh, brownouts and, and slowdowns simply because the, si the system locally, the towers locally are overloaded. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. So I guess a follow up of my question um, or my own question for that would be, so would more towers help with that? Yes. And that's the uh, idea behind 5G is they're adding many more smaller uh, towers. And uh, generally the smaller ones are going to be cheaper, but it's going to take a while to, to build all of them out. Again, they're going to be five G uses at least the, the the high band uses much higher frequencies, which don't penetrate. So we're going to need more of those anyway in order to get uh, get service. Uh, the uh, larger cities like New York and San Francisco are going to be built out first with these, it seems, and there may be a few other cities uh, that the carriers experiment with um, with some of their new technologies. Uh, but that's why we're going to. It's going to take a while uh, to to see five G full five G uh, fully implemented everywhere. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, this next question is: Does beam forming make the connection safer? Um, I don't think I don't think it matters one way or the other. Um, but it it definitely decreases the amount of interference, and then uh, it it would decrease the amount of uh, electromagnetic radiation that's being broadcast everywhere. So there's there's less interference um, because it's using each frequency much more efficiently and, and directing it right at the devices that it's communicating with. But I don't know if that if that equates to safer or not. There's just really no evidence that uh, radio frequencies uh, have any real negative effects on people. Um, the only real evidence out there is uh, like in the microwave or in infrared band, if it's super, super concentrated, you'll feel a little bit of heating, but this takes a tremendous amount of power to be able to do that. We feel that's what microwaves are when in your microwave oven. It's uh, basically uh, slightly higher than radio frequency being directed 
really concentrated in a very small space so that it heats up your food. But for say for a microwave tower to uh, be able to generate that kind of heating, uh, it would have to be like you know, take all the take all the power from the Niagara Falls power station to be able to do that. Uh, so that's yeah, that's the only real even remotely plausible concern with these, it, it, and and even that doesn't make any common sense once you understand the physics. Okay, well, thank you for explaining that to us. Um, this next question, and I'm sorry, it's rapid fire here, is um, if you buy a new phone marked 5G, does it still work like other phones today? Asking about that because I need to buy a new phone. What do I get? Yes, it, it'll be backwards compatible with uh, 4G and 3G networks. And in some cases, maybe even 2G, although that's so old, it doesn't really factor in. So any 5G phone that you, you buy will be able to connect to previous generation uh, networks. What the carriers do is they'll run uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G networks concurrently. Um, so if you, for some reason you can't connect to 5G, the phone will automatically switch to a 4G connection that it can make. Um, this is obviously that this will happen in areas that are say rural areas that are underserved you're really far from a 5g tower but you've got three or four 4g towers pretty close so the phone will automatically switch between the networks uh, and is backwards compatible with all the all the previous networks that's really awesome thank you for explaining that to us <laughs> this next is where does wi-fi fall on the electromagnetic spectrum compared to 5g um that's a good question. The uh, I'm forgetting some of these numbers, but it's all down in the radio spectrum, all roughly in the same area. What the what the FCC in the U.S. does, and the, the the counterparts elsewhere throughout the world, is they actually allocate spectrum. Like the military communications has a certain part of the spectrum of the bandwidth on the electromagnetic spectrum. Usually, usually roughly radio frequencies, radio to microwaves is where everyone communicates. So all of that uh, bandwidth has been sliced up for different uses. Um, and any time we introduce a new technology like 4G or 5G, it uses uh, typically higher or more uh, area on, that, on the spectrum, which has to be allocated by the FCC. And these companies like Verizon or Sprint uh, or AT&T have to bid for those frequencies. So they'll pay lots of money in order to get to secure uh, rights to use those frequencies. The reason that the FCC does this is, of course, uh, you don't want, like for instance, military or shortwave communication interfering with cell phone uh, communication. Um, you may notice too that, you, that your, your home Wi-Fi, um, the previous generation home Wi-Fi was down around 2.4 gigahertz, which is about the same as your microwave oven. Uh, so anytime you run the microwave, uh, what used to happen, at least at my house, was uh, you'd get uh, decreased internet service. Like the kitchen was poorly served to begin with, and the, our, our internet service would go out completely whenever we're running the microwave because they're interfering with each other. They both run on roughly the same frequency. Now, the newer home Wi-Fi networks will run at about 5 gigahertz, which is roughly twice that of the old one. Uh, and there's not a whole lot else that's operating up in that frequency range, which is one of the reasons why uh, 5G home networks are uh, less susceptible to interference. And it's a higher frequency, so you'll get two, three times the bandwidth, uh, basically the download speeds through a, a, a home 5G network. You can actually stream movies very easily with a home 5G network, and with the, the old 2.4 gigahertz networks, you couldn't. Wow. Thanks, Chuck. Um, this next person is wondering, are you familiar with disaster land? Disaster land. Disaster land? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I need um, more information. Jim, if you want to type in a little more there, we can see. <laughs> um, so this next one, why does my cell phone feel warm after I use it for a while? And I'm wondering that too. <laughs> well, uh, 
there's a just like with any electronic device, you've got electrons running through um, all of the components in there. And anytime uh, you have an electric current of some kind, you're you're generating some amount of heat as the uh, basically the the electrons kind of bump around, bump into each other. Um, so that's that's the short answer. Uh, and the same thing happens when you're draining a battery as well. Um, so you're always going to get some amount of heating whenever you're running an electronic device. And the little uh, lithium ion batteries that are in virtually every device nowadays, even uh, like electric cars, are super, super high energy density. Um, and if you're using a phone to do some, or a laptop or a tablet to do some intensive task, it's going to start draining the battery by pulling a lot more current. More current means more heating. And uh, the, most devices are designed to, to get warm and be fine with it. Although occasionally, I know with some of the early 5G uh, radios that were in smartphones, they, there were some overheating problems. They, they hadn't, there were some manufacturing defects or maybe they, for some reason there was, uh, um, they had some problems early on, which were, which are now fixed. I know some of the early Samsungs or others had, uh, were, were overheating on a regular basis. And again, the higher, the, the more data you use, uh, the bigger your screen, the, the, uh, the, the brighter your screen, uh, all of those things mean you're using more juice, which means more heat. All right, thanks, Chuck. Um, the next one is my Verizon Files Wi-Fi has two options for connecting any device, one normal one and one followed by 5G in the name. So two different options in my house, What's going on there? Do you know? And which is better for me to connect to, or doesn't it matter? I like the emoji. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is a big confusion amongst a lot of people. Uh, the, the Verizon home Wi-Fi devices that you get that they, when you buy the service, they give you your equipment, you set it up. Uh, the, what the, the Wi-Fi networks have a, have a name so you can connect to them using your phone or your, your laptop. And the 2.4 gigahertz, uh, the older style Wi-Fi, which is more compatible with some older devices, say something you bought maybe 10 or 12 years ago, um, that will be often labeled 2G. And then the 5 gigahertz uh, network, which is compatible with most newer devices in the last decade or so, uh, is much faster and that will be labeled 5G. So some people want the old 2.4 gigahertz network so they can be compatible with some older devices. And Verizon provides, two, by default, uh, two of those uh, home Wi-Fi networks, which you can have the option of connecting to. The problem is, is they name them 2G or 5G, which confuses the heck out of people because they think that's, that means the same as a cellular network, second generation or fifth generation. All that means is 5G for your home network means that's five gigahertz. That's the frequency that uh, the, the Wi-Fi is running on. It has nothing to do with a cellular network, no, no relation between the two other than the fact that you're sending data through a radio signal. Ooh. Other than that, they're completely different. Good so don't know. be confused. Don't be confused by 2G or 5G on a home network. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, this next one is, what's the best way to conserve my cell phone's battery life? Uh, uh, keep the screen turned down or shut it off. <laughs> but don't forget to turn I'd, it back on. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Screen brightness is typically 70% you know, of your battery consumption. It, if you have really poor eyesight or something like that, um, it, it's often not an option um, to turn it down. But if you, it, there's usually some settings uh, you can adjust on any phone that will automatically adjust the brightness based on ambient conditions. I know the iPhones kind of do all of this automatically, but you, you can drag the brightness down to uh, a tolerable level um, as much as you can stand, basically, and that will extend your battery life considerably. Uh, it, if The other thing that tends to drain a battery is if in your, in you're in a really poor coverage area, say part of the house where your Wi-Fi doesn't reach very well or your uh, your uh, uh, cellular service 
doesn't reach very well. The, the phones will spend an inordinate amount of time like hunting for a good signal uh, and, and it'll spend a lot of energy to do that. And so you will notice if, if you keep your phone in an area where coverage is poor, just set it down for a couple hours, you'll notice the battery has drained quite a bit. So try to try to uh, stay in a good coverage area with your, with your phone. Uh, that's, I see that a lot, but the screen brightness is the biggie. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Just seeing one more thing here. So uh, this is back to disaster land. It said, my son wrote some of the code for DL. I had exclusive bandwidth to let emergency services to network when needed. EC was, is a client. Ah, okay. Yeah. Not a project I was involved with. So, um, sounds really, really pretty cool though. Um, that's, that would be emergency services and Homeland security probably. It sounds almost top secret. It does. <laughs> Are you sure you should be telling us about that? <laughs> All right, cool. I know that you have your Q&A panel up. I don't know if you want to quick scroll, see if there's anything I missed or I didn't see at all. You might've gotten stuff I didn't. Um, yeah, I see you mentioned concerns about driverless cars. What other oh, concerns yeah. about 5G? Um, well, no, nothing in particular to 5G. I do, I, I do worry about autonomous vehicles. I'm just not sure how quickly those are going to be adopted. It's almost like uh, the safety concerns aside, it, I wonder how acceptant people will be of, of this technology. It's almost like you know, we haven't had um, pilotless aircraft, even though we've had the technology to do so for 35 or 40 years. Um, simply because most passengers would never accept the fact that there's not a human being up front, or at least a couple human beings in most cases, flying them to, uh, you know, Chicago. Um, so a lot of this is a, is really a sociological, psychological, uh, uh, thing as well as to, to, as a technological one. But when it comes to driverless cars, I'm not sure. I think I see similar issues and I also see issues with things like in really the, the problem with navigating in really bad weather, um, especially heavy rain, snow, things like that. And autonomous cars have had big problems doing that reliably. Um, also, it's going to, in some cases, require the embedding of a lot of new technology in the roadbed, in the, in the, in the guardrails, just as a fallback. Uh, as a as a as a safety measure, uh, redundant safety measure to the this just the standard free navigation that this vehicle is doing. Also, uh, I I know a lot of trucking companies would love to save money by uh, getting rid of all of their employees and just having autonomous trucks delivering things everywhere. And I see that as yet one more way that we're going to be uh, losing gainful employment for a lot of people. So there's to every new technology and every new solution that you, that, uh, you develop, um, there's always new problems that are created. And a lot of them you can't, you can't even foresee. So I'm always a little cautious when it comes to, to new technology. Uh, you only hope that the, the new problems are smaller or more manageable than the old problems that you're trying to solve. Does that make sense? I think. I think that was a great explanation. Thank you. And um, we have IMHO, which I just learned is in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my eyesight will limit to drive, so auto autos is of interest. That's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that will it will probably help a lot of people in that situation. Um, but uh, calling up an Uber is, will do the same thing, or or a, or a taxi. So I think there there are many ways to solve that problem. Um, the, what, what another thing that autonomous vehicles may do is, uh, vastly increase the number of vehicles on the road and all of our roads, because the, the cost to entry, so to speak, will be, uh, much cheaper and much easier. Um, so I'm also a little bit worried about that. The, the, the whole social economics of, of the transportation may change completely and, uh, just in terms of, we're getting back to 5G here, uh, having 
the internet even faster and more available. Um, we're all, everyone's already staring at their phones constantly all the time anyway, and not really interacting with each other. That's a whole other thing that I, I kind of worry about as a, as a technologist. I, I, I don't, I don't think we've handled the current iteration of the internet very, very well. Um, and you can see that with all the disinformation and uh, hijacking of social media and and uh, bad actor, bad uh, government actors that are trying to influence our election, and uh, lots of, lots of stuff like that, which we uh, uh, didn't foresee thirty years ago. Yeah, it's definitely a lot to think about. So I'm not seeing any more questions, Chuck. I'm just seeing a bunch of thank yous. Katie, Chuck, thank you. Thank you for explaining this so well. Thank you for your time. Um, so Chuck will be back on July 1st with us at 10 a.m. for protecting your privacy online. So we're looking forward to that. This kind of dovetails into what I was just talking about. So Exactly. And then great yeah. topic. Thank you so much for your time. So Chuck, thank you for all you do for us at the county and educating and helping me. <laughs> Well, thank you, Katie. You're you make it easy. You're a rock star when it comes to this stuff. So you're a pleasure to pleasure to work with. And thank you for having me uh, having me on. Hopefully, uh, uh, everyone that in attendance learned a little something today. And hopefully, I gave them gave everyone a little something to think about as well. I think you did. So everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you next time. And Chuck, I'll talk with you offline.